Good day, class. Today we'll be discussing Chapter 16 of our text, Public Restrooms, Should They Be Gender Neutral? These two comparative essays both deal with the issues of public safety, issues of gender rights, transgender issues, and the different kind of um, public conflict that's arisen over this issue with different um, points about various legislation trying to regulate bathroom use both in public schools as well as public facilities that have come up in the last several years um, and only brought this issue more and more to the public forum. And so these two articles can explore more of this history of this and also then different opposing viewpoints on the pros and cons of changing gender regulations for bathrooms. All right, so first one we're going to look at is called Bathroom Politics, Preserving the Sanctity of the Ladies' Room by Pamela Powers Hanley on page 447. She starts off giving like an historical overview of the topic from the 1950s. Women's restrooms were more of seen as a safe space, had like a lounge, more of like a symbol than for women's refuge from the rest of a more male-dominated world than public space. And so she goes into like how this idea of public restrooms as part of society has changed over time and has been tied to gender identity for a long time as well. Uh, she goes into page 448 and she starts to argue that some of the problems of adults forcing kids to choose gender when they're too young to understand. This is when she mentions this on page 448. She cites from one of her outside sources, um, paragraph 10. Uh, latest twist in Arizona bathroom politics comes after a Henry Elementary School girl who identifies as a boy used the boys' room at a school. Shortly after that, Tucson Unified School District changed its non-discrimination policy. Uh, TUSD amended its non-discrimination policy on March 14, added gender identity of ex or expression to a list that prohibits discrimination based on disability, race, color, religious belief, sex, sexual orientation, age, or national origin. While the policy does not directly adore, address bathroom use by transgender children, the discussion that led to the change stemmed from an incident at Henry Elementary School, 650N Iago Way, in which parents raised concerns about a transgender student using the boys' restroom. Sanchez, TUCUSD superintendent, said the policy revision is in line with the case law that's gone all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. She goes on to add this when she says in paragraph 16, the two stories about young children self-identifying as the opposite gender concern me. First of all, how can a five-year-old know and express the beliefs he feels more comfortable as a girl? I do believe that people can show signs of being gay when they are children. In my opinion, the concept of gender identification is far more complex and beyond the intellectual capacity of an elementary school student. I wonder what role parents and psychologists have played in the self-identification. She adds on to part of this problem, she thinks, as parents then kind of forcing kids to do these issues when they don't understand them fully themselves yet. I mean, it's more complicated than it needs to be. And she goes on to page 449, paragraph 20, when she points out one possible solution to this is uh, bringing this back to the bathroom question. There are lots of solutions floating around the internet. There are stories like this one about the city of Philadelphia, which recently passed a law saying that all... New or renovated city buildings should include unisex bathrooms, in addition to traditional male and women's restrooms. This is a good solution, in my opinion, because it provides a safe space for everyone, including transgender people and families. It bothers me when my son has to take my little granddaughter. When it bothers me, excuse me, when my son has to take my little granddaughter into the men's room because most restaurants don't have unisex or family bathrooms. I also agree with the converting of all the one seaters out there to unisex bathrooms. So she shows this is a possible solution to try and satisfy everyone. If unisex bathrooms, especially single stall bathrooms, are available, then there's no conflict about who can use which bathrooms, no conflict about transgender rights or people's fears of people of different genders being in the restroom, or people they identify or don't accept as a different gender being in the restroom. And so she sees this as a common solution that can satisfy all different parties and try to avoid this becoming more complicated, especially with new buildings being made, new construction make more and more bathrooms unisex, or especially individual ones, and it'll help kind of move away or try and ease this conflict as it's increasingly come up more and more over the last several years. And then she goes into page 451. She argues that um, she has her own personal experience that many high school bathrooms uh, poor locks, many other shoes, um, 
and he heard that she was a place that's safe to use. So this kind of goes into her point about her own experience working different schools, that issues of safety in restrooms already are an issue because many of them don't have safe locks as it is, and the reason why some people are concerned about bathrooms being mixed gender. She adds on in the middle of page 451, on the grounds of safety, I completely disagree with the idea of making all public bathrooms, including those of multiple stalls, gender neutral, and thus allowing anyone to go anywhere. So it shows her overall main argument that she's against having all gender neutral bathrooms. The slate author misses the point. This may come as a newsflash to some, but women don't trust men. It's not just about sensitivity to assault victims, although that is part of it, that I oppose neutralization bathrooms. It's about common sense and safety for everyone especially the vulnerable, which include women, the young, elderly, and yes, transgender and transsexual people. But I want my little granddaughter or my 90-year-old mother to be forced to use a gender-neutral bathroom with men. No. So it shows in why she also sees complete neutral bathrooms as a problem, because in general, issues of threats against women or the elderly or children already exist as it is, and she doesn't see this as making that better. So it goes into some of the ethical appeals of safety that a lot of her essay tries to address. And she ends her essay, paragraph 40, goes more into, restates her main argument that single stall bathrooms being all unisex would then satisfy concerns of all parties for safety as well as rights. And on page 452, she argues um, new bathroom stalls would have more men's and women's and family bathrooms, also family bathrooms she sees as some solve all these issues because then people can take their, their children or grand or parents or siblings they care for to use restrooms that will help solve a lot of these concerns as well. Um, she goes into question three, or point three on page 452, says that I am not afraid of trans women in the women's room. I totally get a why they don't want to use men's room. It's the same reason why I oppose full gender neutral bathrooms. And let's see, existing multi stall bathrooms are sealed up for privacy, often with heavy doors. Putting men and women in the same bathroom is when they are designed in this way because the vulnerable up for assault. It also goes back to my original concern, privacy, and sanctuary women. So she ends her main point, why she sees people be afraid of using bathrooms with men. So a lot of this it has to do with largely seeing the fears or dangers men post women in society. And that's kind of a larger ethical point of safety she brings up and why uh, she thinks single-cell restrooms is a solution to all those concerns. Uh, the second essay, Why All Public Bathrooms Should Be Gender Neutral, by Nico Lang, uh, it gives examples of the kind of harassment that currently happens, what he sees as arguing why bathroom rules have to change. He cites this in the uh, second column, where he says, The 26-year-old had been repeatedly stopped, denied entry, and kicked out of both bathrooms. As soon as someone can't read in your gender, they are afraid of you, Norrell said. People don't like it if they don't know if you're a man or woman. There's no gray area for anybody. So he gives examples of the kind of harassment he says happens now, when people are seen as not fitting one clear gender or another, at least by the people. He cites his thesis, paragraph 9, page 463, when he says, These cases prove something that should be obvious by now. Gendered restrooms don't work. So his overall argument is the current system of work has to change. As a common strategy for a lot of arguments is identifying a problem and then explain why it's a problem, why it matters, and why it should be fixed, and then any of the proposed solutions in some way and how that would work. Goes into paragraph 16 on paragraph page 453, when he argues that since the Roaring Twenties, many of these divides have been torn down. Today, men and women share apartment buildings. They sit side by side in public transportation, church. Sex is absolutely do not, however, to pee, pee together. This is both a matter of social custom and all themselves. Nolan Brown states that part of the problem is that businesses are legally prohibited from offering only gender-neutral bathrooms. He many states that many of these potty parity codes mandate a certain ratio of women's to men's restrooms. But that's slowly changing. This is one main point he brings up is that the laws are outdated. These laws were changed to make um, more equal access to restrooms, especially as more women entered the workplace in the last century. Now he says the same laws are causing a problem where more creates an obstacle to have more gender neutral bathrooms, which would then reduce some of the prejudice and conflicts and harassment that's currently already happening. Then he goes on to paragraph 20. Uh, he argues that it shows that it can be accepted having more public restrooms to be unisex, it says the United States, New York, Washington, D.C., Austin, Texas, and San Francisco have all championed the desegregation of public facilities. Nation's capital has long led the way in this issue. Back in 06, the D.C. Office of Human Rights mandated that all single occupancy restrooms across the city be accessible to all genders. 
So it gives a similar proposal to what the first essay does. Single stall restrooms, especially being gender neutral, help reduce harassment, still have equal access and civil with anyone, and they'll reduce the conflicts, especially with people that are transgender being harassed by other people. And he goes on to page 454, he argues in paragraph 26 and 27, his stats show that sex crimes, having bathrooms are very unlikely. So this is where he addresses the counter-argument. This is one that was referenced a lot, especially with legislation that was passed in some states or tried to be passed, that would try and reinforce bathrooms to be assigned for people to use them only based on their birth certificate, gender ID. His point being that those laws, while the arguments people made supporting them, was to reduce possibility of sex crimes. He counters this paragraph 25 and 26 by saying that there's no data to really show a essential threat of sex crimes against people in restrooms, and that this largely undermines his fear. So he totally under he totally points out why that argument is flawed and can't be used to argue these very strict codified gender rules for restrooms. And in fact, as he mentions earlier, transgender people oftentimes are more likely to be harassed or attacked or suffer some kind of violence against them than other people are. And he goes in a paragraph top of page 455 where it says, In Houston, Texas, cities of a non-discrimination bill voted down last November attempted to brand trans people as dangerous bathroom predators, ready to attack other bathroom users even given the chance. That myth, however, has been thoroughly disproven. Currently, 190 cities around the country allow trans people equal access to public restrooms, and there are yet to be a surge of violence in those areas. So he further shows in less regulation in some cities that have happened already in almost 200 cities, there's no record of increased violence showing this fear then is unwarranted based more on prejudice than actual logical data. He goes in paragraph 30, shows data shows that sexual assault against trans people is much more likely. He shows this is also an ongoing issue, which highlights why it has to be addressed. Paragraph 35 and 36 argues the plus for having less bathrooms, uh, wait times as well, and it ends with appeal to common humanity, this idea of having consideration for all people, and that if this makes a more efficient system, maybe more gender-neutral restrooms, it's a solution that can appeal to all people and ensure all rights are protected and concerns are addressed, rather than giving a prejudice and creating laws that are ineffective and not based on accurate data. All right, that concludes Chapter 16. Uh, please look for the next upcoming chapter, I think it's 22, and there'll be the next video. And before that, will be some physical lectures already posted in web class or in Canvas as well. All right, have a good day.